This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been doing therapy now for over 25 years. So I really am so glad you're here. I started self-work in order to reach out and extend the walls of my practice, so to speak, to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological and emotional issues. Maybe you're in therapy. To those of you who've just been diagnosed with depression or anxiety or you're having some kind of relationship issue that you just can't seem to resolve, or to a third group, those of you who might have some sort of stigma or discrimination against therapy in general and therapists, but you're just curious enough to listen in to a podcast. So I'll give you my ideas, and then you can make up your mind. I just put down John Moe's new book, The Hilarious World of Depression, and not only was it really good and much recommended reading for any of you experiencing depression, it reminded me of something very important, the need to be transparent about my own mental struggles. Yes, I've named them. I've said I have panic disorder, or more specifically, performance anxiety, which is a specific kind of social anxiety. And I've mentioned having full-blown anorexia in college, but I haven't told my story, the why of either of these issues, at least as best I understand it now from my own perspective, and the perspectives of several therapists over the years. Those of you who know anything about anxiety or eating disorders know that obviously control has been a huge issue in my life, as anorexia is all about an attempt to get control, and panic is losing control, which compounds into the fear of losing more control. So I'm inspired and a little nervous today, frankly, in this episode sponsored once again by BetterHelp. But I'm going to tell you my story, the why of my own mental illness, and hope that it helps in some way. The listener email for today is from a young woman whose mom is undergoing some type of emotional breakdown after the death of her own father and how that dynamic could be affecting the writer's choice about getting out of a relationship. So sit back and relax or continue walking or driving or whatever you're doing. And I'm going to tell you my story. In my graduate school training, I was taught all kinds of theories about how and why people develop mental illness. And yet I'd already experienced and was experiencing my own mental and emotional battles while I was in graduate school. So I'd been searching for those answers for quite a while. I guess I believed and still believe that if you understand the why, then perhaps it will help guide you toward how you're going to get better. There were definitely genetic predispositions for my anxiety in my family. I found an old copy from my local newspaper in my small hometown in Arkansas from perhaps the 1930s about my paternal grandfather. I found this after my mom and dad died. In it, my grandfather was being teased about his very evident nervousness when he tried to speak in front of people. The language was very flowery, as I recall, but I had to laugh when I read it for the first time. My dad had never said a word about any anxiety that his dad might have had, but he was only 15 when my grandfather died, so perhaps he didn't even know. But it was definitely describing performance anxiety or a panic attack. Interestingly, my brother also struggled with performance anxiety while he was alive. My mother also had significant anxiety, mostly about maintaining order and always being perfectionistically prepared, no matter what was coming. Those of you who know about my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, might smile at this and say, oh, so she wrote about her mother like most of us do. <laughs> Perhaps you're right. But my mother prepared whether it was for a party or for the end of the world because of nuclear war. Whatever it was, my mom was prepared. But she also struggled with depression. Later on in my life, I suspected that there had been some kind of trauma in her life, but she never revealed it. As on the surface, everything looked as if she had her world in the palm of her hand. 
But another factor in my battle for control and esteem was what I absorbed about the role that I was taught was mine as a woman. I was born in the mid-50s, and to be a proper Southern girl, you needed to get married and be a good wife. As a child and a teenager, I took etiquette lessons, literally walked with a book on my head and recited Shakespearean sonnets. I balked at learning to play the harp. That was just a no. The older I grew and women like Gloria Steinem were coming onto the scene with their fervent messages of feminism, I felt quite trapped. My mom, despite being an accomplished pianist and organist and who was good enough to study at Juilliard one summer, only played occasionally, citing that being a wife and mother had to take precedence, and there was a subtle and not-so-subtle message that I was supposed to follow her lead. Now, neither parent ever sat me down and said, you must do as we feel is best, but I'd still absorbed that there was a good way to be and a bad way to be, and the bad way was to not adopt the model I'd grown up seeing. It was obvious that the rules for my brothers were very different than for me all along the way. Again, not stated, but understood. And in many ways, my parents were harder on them as they expected the boys to be more responsible much earlier. They were to get a degree, find a career, and start working. I, however, was told that I shouldn't push so much, that it was okay to study music, but not to be too serious about it, because, you see, I loved singing and music. It was my life. I played the piano, the guitar, I sang. I spent hours practicing, but I was not supposed to be a musician. I started rebelling in high school, making my own decisions about where I went to college, for example, and I chose a liberal college in Memphis, then called Southwestern at Memphis, now it's Rhodes, and there I discovered independence. I was still caught in two worlds, the one where I'd follow my mom's path and the one where I wanted to follow my own. I was in a sorority, for example, but I didn't date the right guys. I hung out, guess what, with musicians, did theater, all the while making straight A's. So the parental message I got was always was that I was loved, but I could make better choices in men. By the time I was a junior, I knew I wanted, desperately wanted, a music degree, wanting to switch from French, which was a little silly in the first place, to music, and it would have meant another semester or perhaps a year in college, I'm not sure I remember, but it was where my heart was. I had taken almost all the required music courses I could fit into my schedule. I loved singing, conducting a choir, and saw myself becoming a church choir director. Oh, that's another thing. I was fervent in my faith, but wasn't exactly following the rules as far as virginity was concerned either. So that's another struggle. My parents said no to the music degree. Why? I still cannot reason, as I ended years later being a professional singer, but in bars and restaurants. I'm sure you're shaking your head and saying, now that was passive aggressiveness or certainly rebellion. This battle for control was full on when I developed anorexia in my junior year of college and into my senior year. I wanted desperately to please, to be a good daughter and woman, but I also wanted a different life. Such began my need to control. I couldn't control much but I could control the food that went into my body. I didn't know that then, of course. It wasn't conscious on my part, but that's what was happening. I had full-blown anorexia. I lost all the way down to 100 or 101 pounds, and I remember hoping against hope that I'd make 99. I graduated from college low on self-esteem, but very thin, and feeling falsely in control. My parents sent me to Europe. Again, you see the difference in what the boys should do and what I should do. Hoping I'd come back, having gotten my need for independence and a music degree out of my system. But that trip only whetted my appetite. I came home, of course, engaged to a Frenchman, because how can you not? <laughs> but as Catherine Hepburn said in a movie on Golden Pond, that didn't work out. And I'm actually lucky it didn't, because that relationship had been emotionally abusive and whatever gains I had made in self-esteem were actually destroyed by him. I denied all that, by the way. I even agreed to marry him, but luckily it just fell apart. I was frantic after that for affirmation, as a woman, as a musician, as a person. 
my anorexia was actually better when I was living in Europe. And by the time I got home, I was still very thin, but had broken through some of those very painful habits. However, I was still caught up in the numbers on the scale and watched my weight very closely for years, taking diet pills when I thought I needed them. My friends called the doctor who gave them to me, Dr. Death. I was all into a number on a scale, helping me feel okay about Margaret. Before we go on, I want you to hear a message from BetterHelp. I've been doing teletherapy now for four months, and I can't tell you I'm much more of a believer in it than I was five months ago. It truly can be effective, and here's their great offer. I was delighted when BetterHelp reached out to me as a potential sponsor. What exactly is BetterHelp? BetterHelp is an online therapy service that will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's not a crisis line. It's not really self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. I also tried this out, of course, for my self-work listeners, and I was very impressed with the two counselors I tried. There's a broad range of expertise, and you're actually matched to the therapist that they believe will work best for you. You can have video sessions, phone sessions, you can text, and actually it's much less expensive than quote-unquote normal therapy. And BetterHelp is rated number one by so many platforms that specialize in trying to help you find the best therapy online for you. There's a special offer for self-work listeners where you get 10% off your first month at trybetterhelp.com slash self-work. That's trybetterhelp, that's H-E-L-P dot com slash self-work. You can begin getting help today, and I highly recommend it. So give it a try. I'm not going to go into a monologue about my next choices. Let's simply say that being frantic and not realizing it caused me to make choices that were also frantic. I married twice, and I know I broke my parents' hearts when I did, because they weren't good relationships. They weren't solid. They weren't stable. And I'm truly remorseful about that, for hurting my parents, for just generally creating chaos. Both men were musicians, of course, and there's nothing wrong with musicians, mind you. But more importantly, both of those relationships were battles for control. Again, that issue with control. My own shame about the mess my life was in, which I tried to hide through making jokes and trying to look as if I had everything in perfect control when I traveled home for a visit. I still thought I could be everything to everybody, no problem. I tried to deny the struggle that was within me, but in the end, I couldn't. And I actually didn't like who I was becoming, or certainly a big chunk of her. The trap I was in began to have a more dramatic effect, and then it happened. I lost control and had my first panic attack, ironically, when I was singing in church. I'm sure my latent anxiety was there in other forms, but suddenly I, like my grandfather before me, was drenched in sweat, trying to sing while holding desperately onto the side of the organ to hide my shaking, people looking at me as if they'd never seen me before. After all, Margaret was the person who could perform anywhere, anytime, but my life had become one big performance, and I couldn't pull it off anymore. The panic itself would come and go for a while, being gone long enough for me to convince myself it had simply been a one-time thing, but then it was a two-time thing, and then a three, and even I saw the pattern, even though I didn't want to, as anxiety began to seep into more of my life. It was relief in many ways when I decided to leave the music business, as I thought I'd not have that anxiety anymore, but much to my dismay, any time the light was on me or I felt like it, to give a speech in class or to speak at a committee meeting or to sing, here the panic would come back. It was humiliating. I got meds to help and finally found a therapist who began helping me see that the panic was something I needed to understand and have compassion for, not hatred. This I've talked about a lot on self-work. I have kind of skipped over about a depression I had, as depression itself has always seemed less of an issue for me. But I remember waking up three short weeks after being married the first time, and I felt this yawning emptiness and darkness inside of me. I remember sitting in a chair for hours in my home, not feeling anything, not crying, but I was confused. 
I knew I'd never been more sad, but I couldn't access my emotions. I was simply flat. That lasted a few weeks, and I returned to therapy as I knew something was terribly wrong. I slowly got better, but also realized the breadth of the consequences of the decisions I'd made. For more than just me. I wanted to hide, but I couldn't. I went on trying to see if the wreck that was my life was salvageable. Sadly, it took me years and more immature mistakes before I could find peace with myself and that life I hoped for. I wish I'd listened more carefully to the message my unconscious was giving me when I had that first panic attack. I wish I'd stopped in my tracks and admitted something's really wrong. I wish I'd been more comfortable with my own vulnerability instead of needing to hide it. But I learned those lessons much later. I've told this story once on self-work, but it's another time I wished I'd stopped and looked around more objectively. My dad was driving me and my then-boyfriend to go move my things out of the home me and my first husband had lived in together. I was laughing and giggling, but I looked over at my dad's face. He was driving a U-Haul, and there was a solitary tear rolling down his cheek. This was before my first panic attack, but it's heavily connected in my own mind. He was so sad, and I'm sure very disappointed in me. What did I do? I acted as if I hadn't seen him, but it made an indelible impression on me. Later, my own inner struggles would emerge as that panic, and even then, I remembered his tears. But it took me, again, years and good therapy to make those connections. It seems obvious now, but it simply wasn't then. I will say that years later, my dad and I were alone, and I reminded him of that day. His first words were, oh, let's not talk about that, so much is different now. But I put my hand on his arm and said, Dad, I saw that you were crying, and I'm sorry I didn't pay attention. I'm sorry I hurt you. He being him said, it's okay. I'm not inferring that everyone's panic is connected with shame or chaos. In my own work as a therapist, I do try to see what could be trapping someone, however, or where parts of a person are battling with other parts, causing an inner struggle that's coming out as a panic attack. Maybe it's about old trauma that's never been connected with, and it's calling for attention. It could be so many things. Of course, there are things that can help, many, many things that can help. Exercise, sleep, nutrition, therapy, massage, and other body work. Good, solid relationships. Remember, there can be a genetic or an inherited component that sets you up. There can even be something called intergenerational trauma or sense of trauma being handed down via the generations. Think of Holocaust victims or slavery. And those things, those dynamics might beg to be understood. Figuring out panic can be quite a journey. You know, I never knew my grandfather, but I bet he and I might be somewhat alike. My dad would say I was. I can only wonder what his own inner struggles were. Thank you for listening to my story. And I can only hope that it helps you. Our listener email today asks some really interesting questions. It's a little long, but I think all of it's important to read. Here we go. I've just been listening to a couple of your older podcast episodes today, one on dealing with judgment, both fearing and making judgment, and the other on negative self-talk. As these are issues I've been speaking with my therapist about recently, I want you to know how grateful I am that you created your podcast. I feel lucky to have found it by accident. I'm one of those people you refer to in your episodes as the one who won't darken the door of a therapist. In fact, I've noticed that it's almost been driven into me to be anti-therapy. My mother always had the phrase of, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and I've always tried to work through any problems I face on my own. It was working, or at least I thought it was, until this time last year, when I broke up with a long-term boyfriend and felt so lost, like I'd forgotten what was important to me, and I'd been so wrapped up in cheering someone else up for so long that I'd been struggling to trust my own thoughts know what I value, and to trust decisions I'm making in my life. I knew something had to be done, but I was not sure what. So, I threw myself into trying new activities and meeting new people to test the waters. 
Then last summer, my grandfather passed away, and I never really had much chance to build on trusting my values. My mother, who has always had a strong moral compass, who works hard and who is very loving, suddenly became this person who would cry every day after her dad died, both her parents now having passed. One evening, I saw her literally crumble to the floor, sobbing and shaking, saying, What am I without them? It was heartbreaking. A part of me saw her pain, and I also saw what more pain I've probably got coming, too. It was around this time I started listening to your podcasts regularly. You know, I find that certainly that happened to me when both my parents died, is that I realized that my son would feel what I was feeling, and I'm sure he realized it, too. Anyway, back to her email. I met this man back in December who was so open about the good and bad parts of his life. He mentioned how he has turned his life around drastically in the last year and how he had seen a therapist about depression. So I did it. I started seeing my own therapist this January, and I'm still talking with them, and I can't tell you how grateful I am because I don't think I would have started this all without your podcast to begin with. What I have to say next is something I'm also going to ask my own therapist. But given your tendency to talk about methods to solve problems, I like that, I thought I would ask you to. What I'm writing to you today about is the man I started a relationship with in December. I began having strong feelings for him before we were locked down in March. But we had an argument on the phone about a sarcastic joking behavior, which I was trying to explain was hurtful. It all revolved around a couple of offhand comments that came across like a sexual innuendo when taken out of context. This man's best friend is a girl who I also really like. They were having dinner, and she asked if he wanted a fork. He joked about this comment in a message to me, taking it out of its literal context to make it sound like forking. He's very sarcastic in nature, which I normally like, but I felt this particular comment wasn't appropriate. Our argument got out of hand, As I said, he'd made such comments before. I felt like he was unable to comprehend or appreciate my point of view and how my interpretation of his behavior made me feel hurt and disrespected. He didn't understand why it had anything to do with who said what to whom, but more that the phrasing itself was just funny when not construed literally. So I can understand his point, but I still implied meaning and saw a visual I don't want to think of or hear about. This resulted in raised voices and me telling him it can't work and we're done. Both he and I have been communicating in messages briefly and being friendly, but the lack of ability to meet face-to-face to discuss this heated argument has been taking its toll. A part of me wonders if I was too rash in ending a relationship during a heated argument, and I'm struggling to deal emotionally with this limbo situation and not being able to speak properly with him to see if this could be worked on or not. So I answered this back in April, I think. So I've kind of forgotten what I said, so I'm going to read it. Thank you for reaching out and being a listener. First, hearing about your mom's breakdown is very sad. What I've frequently seen is that people who don't connect with painful feelings as they emerge don't get the practice they need, so that when something even more painful occurs, they've built skills to handle it. I certainly hope she's better now. And I hope she sought some kind of grief counseling. What I meant by this was that she certainly sounded like the stiff upper lip kind of person. And yet often, then when something really tragic happens, it can so surprise you with its overwhelming power that you haven't grieved other smaller things. So I'm wondering if that could be part of this dynamic, but I don't have any information about her relationship with her parents. So I don't really know what that's all about. Maybe she was even abused by her own father. Who knows? But I certainly hope she got some help. As far as your guy friend, and you may have resolved this by now, it's a little harder to say. His remarks, which conveyed sexual innuendo, may have been some kind of showing off or were immature, certainly. But it sounds like flags are going up for you about his ability to have empathy and take responsibility for the impact he may have on you. I don't know, really, if you acted impulsively, The two of you had only known each other for two months, and that's not very long. So perhaps you did, and with more thought, he'd apologize and say he'd try to curtail those kinds of comments. But I also don't want you to make the mistake of not paying attention to an initial warning sign. So I'd keep talking about it, maybe see how he's feeling, and go from there. But if it's something that's unresolved in you, I would definitely reach out to him and say, listen, 
even if it's over the phone or over Zoom or house party or whatever we need to do, I'd like to talk to you about what happened so you can find your own peace. And of course, I'm delighted you found a therapist. So please take care. Thank you to all of you for listening to Self Work, either for the first time or for one of many times. You cannot know how much I appreciate the emails, the Instagram messages, that kind of thing that y'all are sending me to show your appreciation for my continuing to do self work. It means a lot to me. I'm truly grateful. I have a book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, that has been published within the last seven or eight months. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and at your bookstore if you'd like to give them some business. It's all about how perfectionism and a perfect-looking life can mask what is really intense pain underneath. And the better you are at it, the more you tend to feel very trapped within it. And I have a way out. I offer over 60 exercises for you to do. Actually, they're for anybody to do, but they're geared specifically toward people who tend to be perfectionistic at this point. Maybe there'll be another book making them more general. I do want to invite all of you. I have a Facebook closed group. It's facebook.com slash group slash self work. And this afternoon on Friday the 17th, when this episode actually airs, I will be offering a workshop on perfectly hidden depression. You do have to join the group, but I will let you in. It's at 4 o'clock Central Standard Time. This is my second one that I'm offering there, and I'd love for you to be there, too. We're going to be talking about doing the exercises in the book, or I'll answer any question that you might have. Also, thank you so much for leaving written reviews on Amazon for the book or for this podcast on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you listen. I do read them, and they mean so much to me, and I get ideas of what you might like to hear and what you particularly don't like to hear. There are lots of ways of reaching out to me. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com, and you can subscribe there and get a weekly newsletter that will give you my weekly blog post as well as this weekly podcast, and it is a very easy way to keep in touch. I only send one newsletter, I promise. You can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com, and that is confidential. I do read all of those emails, and I will get back with the people that I possibly can. Or you can leave me a voice message on my website, or actually SpeakPipe is also in your show notes. So you can go there, and I'd love to hear you ask me the question. I do have an upcoming seminar on Perfectly Hidden Depression that will be called Together Talks. It's being put together by some people in Boca Raton, Florida, and I'm excited to be able to offer that to you as well. It will be on July the 30th, and I will let you know more about it within the next few days certainly in next week's episode. You can join me over on Instagram. I'm doing a list today. I'm on number 22, my list of what I've learned as a therapist. And there are a lot of things I've learned as a therapist. So I'm really having fun doing that. I also am going to be starting an IGTV channel that will be there on Instagram. So join me. We'll have fun and perhaps learn a lot together. Thank you again so much for being here. Take very, very good care. As I've been saying to people around here, stay safe and sane. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.